Greetings, this is Craig. In this video, I want to talk about navigation in World War II fighters, then I'll fly a mission on DCS multiplayer server and demonstrate how to use these actual, real-world, period-correct methods to find targets and get back to base. I've heard quite a few people on multiplayer servers having trouble navigating to targets, and I think these methods will help with that. So let's get into it. I'm going to use this World War II USAAF manual, as well as another. Now this manual is about 310 pages long, but thankfully there's a lot in it that pertains to bombers and equipment we just don't have in a European theater fighter like the P-47 we'll be flying. That makes our job a lot easier. By the way, I apologize for my voice. I'm fighting a sickness, so it's that time of year. Other than simply following the bombers, which was done sometimes, a P-47 over Europe would use two primary methods of navigation. The first one is pilotage. This is the current description from the Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge. It's simply done by flying from one visible landmark to another and is the oldest form of aerial navigation. As an example, we have three planes here, two P-47s and a Mosquito. They're taking off from Asville to go on an anti-shipping strike on the Wolfpack multiplayer server. I'm not flying with them, I'm just observing taking screenshots. I'll fly a plane later in this video. After takeoff, they turn to a heading known to be more or less towards the target. And then as soon as they're high enough to see a significant distance forward, they simply fly towards a known point. I think they were using these beaches as a reference. That's Groovy Jerry in the Thunderbolt. I'm pretty sure he knows from experience where those two spots are on the map relative to their target. But uh, in any case, this is pilotage, flying from where you are to a, something you can see. And it works, and in some cases it is the best method to use, but of course it has some limitations. Not the least of which is, you have to be pretty familiar with the area to do it. The other two problems are that it's tough to do it with limited visibility, and you usually have to be high enough that you're going to be picked up on enemy radar. Not a problem if you're in an area free of enemy fighters, but in some cases, you want to fly to the target at treetop level. Now, our three heroes on this mission did reach the target and they dealt some serious damage. I think they sunk two ships and knocked another out of action. The other method I want to talk about is dead reckoning. It's still used today and all pilots know how to do this. In that uh, U.S. Army Air Force nav manual from World War II, Dead Reckoning uh, takes up a lot of space because it was a big deal back then. So there's a lot of uh, space in the manual dedicated to the subject. But again, thankfully for us and our purposes of flying a fighter to a target in DCS, a lot of the stuff in the manual just isn't going to matter. We don't need to be familiar with the different types of maps they used or understand how Dead Reckoning is affected by the curvature of the Earth nor do we need to fill out navigation logs or use the specialized equipment and bombers. We're just not going to be flying far enough for these or other factors to matter. So let's cover the basics. Here's a portion of the Normandy map in DCS where we will be doing our work. Let's suppose we want to fly from our base at Asville to a target at Brayhall. In the real world, we would get out a current map and use a plotter, which is just a fancy ruler made for this purpose, and line the thing up in such a way that we would get a true course to target, meaning a direction to fly relative to true north. For example, a true course of 180 would be traveling true south. However, magnetic north, the north point that the compass points to, and true north are not co-located. There's no indication in the airplane for true north. Now, to make matters worse, magnetic north moves around, so it's not the same year to year. Um, we're going to need to correct for the difference between true north and magnetic north. That difference is called magnetic variation. So we need to convert our true course into a magnetic course. Now here is the compass rose from the, from the Wolfpack server. It shows that we need to add 11.5 degrees to the true course to get our magnetic course. I believe that's actually the correct number for magnetic variation over Normandy in 1945. I've seen a 1942 chart and it's only slightly different. So good job to DCS and the people who made the server. Back to our map. 
that's a true course of 191. So we need to add 12 degrees to it, and or 11.5, and fly a magnetic course of 202. Obviously, once again, our course shows us magnetic heading. Now, in the real world, we would then correct for deviation. Deviation is a compass error caused by the installation of the compass into the airplane itself. Deviation numbers are typically very small and are not factored into DCS, at least not the DCS planes I have flown. That's a good thing, as every single serial number airplane is going to be different. And sometimes the planes don't have any magnetic deviation, or the number is zero. So for DCS purposes, we can just forget about this. Last, we would need to factor in the wind, which is a big deal in the real world. If you don't, you're either going to go way off course and not find your target, or if you see the point you're flying to but don't correct for the wind, you'll end up flying a curved path to your target and end up approaching it on a heading opposite to the wind. In the real world, when using dead reckoning, pilots account for the wind by taking known or forecast data and plugging it into an electronic computer, or some still use the World War II era whiz wheel computers, which work really well. Of course, accuracy uh, when you're correcting for winds in pre-flight isn't super good because the forecast winds are usually a little different than what will actually be encountered, which reduces navigation accuracy in a fighter when using dead reckoning over long distances. On the other hand, U.S. bombers could fly incredibly far and with great navigational precision using dead reckoning because they had navigators armed with tools the fighters just didn't have. For example, they could determine their position to an extent at night via celestial navigation. Some had turrets calibrated so that when the gun was on a known landmark, the gunner could report to the navigator the exact angle off the nose. The navigator could then plot a line from that point. With two such fixes, he could determine the exact location of the airplane. U.S. bombers also had something called a drift meter. If the ground was visible, even if only for a short time, the navigator could determine drift from the wind and thus correct for errors in the forecast and report the information to other aircraft so they would get current actual wind data and they'd be able to make corrections too. For these reasons and others, fighters would often follow the bombers. They simply had far better navigation capability. The drift meters were quite complex in both construction and operation. All this can be found in the USAAF nav manual, which is, of course, in the Patreon section. So, in the real world, what you need to do is fly, find the compass heading to reach your destination. Now, to do that, remember this. True virgins make dull company add whiskey. And that's an actual aviation um, term. So, that's true course plus variation equals magnetic course. Add in deviation for company course then correct for winds. Now, in DCS world, because of the short legs we will be flying, combined with the relatively high speed and low altitude for today's mission, the winds are just not going to be a factor. So all we really need to do is take true course and correct it for magnetic deviation. And we can get that right on the map in the Wolfpack server. This will give us our magnetic course, which for our purposes today, is our compass course and is our desired compass heading. Now you can just eyeball this on the chart, which works pretty well, or if you want to be super accurate, screenshot the map and using paint you can put a line on the course you want and drag it to the compass rows. Or you could use the mission builder to draw the line and get the exact true course, then add the 12 degrees. I know it's actually 11.5 degrees of variation on this map, but if you can hold a heading within half a degree in a fighter on DCS, I'm super impressed. So, on to our mission for today. These are the valid targets today on the map. I'm going to hit two of them, as well as overfly Allied ground forces to possibly defend them. I really hope this demonstration shows uh, someone new to DCS World War II airplanes how they can find and hit a target. So, let's get into it. This is the plan. We take off from Asville, position one. Turn left and enter a left downwind, which means we'll be flying just north of the airport on a heading opposite to our takeoff direction. We will overfly the town of Monteborg, and we'll stay low the whole time. Right after takeoff, we are vulnerable to roaming enemy fighters, so I want to get my speed up 
and be ready to drop my ordnance if needed. From Montebourg, we start using our dead reckoning and turn towards Carrington at position 3. Carrington has U.S. forces assembled there, so this gives us two opportunities. First, we may run into attacking German aircraft. If so, we'll dump the bomb load and this becomes an air-to-air -air mission. Otherwise, I'll overfly it. And if an enemy fighter I didn't see is following me, the anti-aircraft fire from the U.S. ground forces will give it away. On this leg from Montebourg to Carrington, uh, this one involves the biggest turn at the start of the leg. Thus, it's the most likely leg that we're going to have to adjust um, our heading on once we see... Uh, where we're going. Now, from Carrington, we're going to proceed to St. Lowe at position four. There are U.S. forces there, so it's the same deal. We're going to overfly and, and uh, be checking six. Now, we'll be checking six all the time while we're flying, but uh, especially after we pass over friendly forces because the tracers from them are going to make it really easy to spot the bad guys if they're chasing us. Then we're going to go via pilotage. So we're going to need to switch from dead reckoning to pilotage at this point. Uh, to attack the German forces at Terigny Suvair at position 5. We don't want to stay here too long because once we attack, the German ground forces will call their friends in the Luftwaffe and we will have about 5 minutes here before we need to bug out unless we want to stay for the air-to-air -air fight, but that's not what this mission's about. So we proceed next to the German headquarters at position 6 and attack them, then we'll head for Lisey and land. We want to depart the German HQ with enough fuel and ammo for a final fight if we run into trouble. Here it is leg by leg. Montebourg to Carrington is on a 161 magnetic heading for about 14 miles. We should be cruising at about 275 miles an hour with our bomb load, so that should only take about 3 minutes. Next on to St. Low, it's only about 15 miles and on the same 161 magnetic heading, so that's only going to take about maybe 3.5 minutes. This will be the easiest leg because we can see the smoke from St. Lo all the way back at Carrington with no problem. At St. Lo, we switch over to pilotage. So this is the point, meaning during the pre-flight, that we want to look at the map closely. We don't want to be trying to figure this part out as we approach the target. When we approach St. Lo, we'll take a slight right turn to a heading of about 170 until we're on the south side of town. Then turn left to a heading of 140 and start a shallow climb. Off to our right, we will see a river. Then St. Suan, I can never remember the name of that. I think of it as Square Town. After that, we should see the three skinny towns which parallel our course and re lead us right into Terigny Suvire. After our attack run, we circle back around to the right so we don't get Terigny confused with St. Amand for our second pass. Now, if we get damaged here, we'll try to get back to base or at least to an allied or neutral field. But if we can't make it back to air, an air base, we'll try to ditch back at St. Lowe and catch a ride back to base on a half track. Next, we head to Bree Hall on a magnetic heading of 260 for six minutes. There isn't much to see on this leg, so I need to do a really good job of holding my heading. And after about five minutes, I'll start a shallow climb to help find the target. Then after the attack run here, it's a 010 heading back to our base, and this is going to take uh, about five minutes, maybe a little more. Enough talk. Let's go into harm's way on the Wolfpack server and put this theory into practice. And uh, I hope this helps people find the targets in DCS. Okay, we're in our P47D40, and we're at Asville on the Wolfpack multiplayer server. Those are human flown planes there, although there are computer flown planes here as well. First thing I want to do is set the parking brake so I don't have to hold the uh, rudder pedal brakes down while I go through my procedures. We're going to talk to the ground personnel, set this thing up with 50% fuel. That's enough for 50 minutes, way more than we need. And I'm going with no tracers. don't want to attract attention to myself. I'm choosing that paint scheme, and I'm going with 250-pound bombs, three of them. We'll talk about the reasoning for that later. And now I want to uh, disconnect my throttle. Well, I'm trying to find the right view to freeze my track IR in the right spot. It's kind of difficult. And I, I want to set my throttle so that it can be worked independently of the turbo boost controller. So that's what I've done now. 
and right about there freeze the track IR get the flap set for takeoff and arm the well, can't right quite click the thing it's hard to find just the right spot put all these Rio stats all the way full brightness and I'm going to shut off the exterior lights anything that turns in DCS in the cockpit you can turn rapidly by left clicking and moving uh, the control up or down all right guns and gun sight are armed uh, we don't have rockets but just procedurally I'm setting those and I'm setting the weapons panel here so that I can drop the bombs they won't be armed just yet but I can drop them right after takeoff if I need to get rid of them for any reason magnetic compass shows zero four zero so the directional gyro is a bit off it's gonna process uh, every now and then and you gotta if you're gonna be using dead reckoning you gotta keep adjusting that thing you can see it's already moved back to the wrong spot because it's not fully spun up uh, it's spun by suction from a vacuum pump so you'll see me checking suction every now and then on the thing. We just set the altimeter to field elevation and the gun sight to the wingspan for a typical German fighter which I'm hoping to not run into but if we do we'll deal with that. Now we're just about ready to go and it looks like it's clear out here. Uh, this other 47 is quite ready to go yet. He is armed to the teeth. He's got uh, 10 rockets and a centerline bomb. Those rockets are great for anti-shipping or anti-armor. We're not set up at all for anti-armor um, on this mission. Again, we'll talk about weapons a little bit later. I want to come to a stop in a safe spot here and do my pre-takeoff check, which is a cigar check. That'll get you through in any World War II era fighter. So we're checking controls for the C and cigar, obviously. The instruments, and uh, by that it means flight instruments and... Um, so I'm looking at my magnetic compass, it shows about 145, and yeah, the directional gyro processed a little bit already, which is normal when you're on the ground, there's not enough suction, it takes time to spin up. Alright, so now it's set, and we want to look at our temperatures, that's really important, and make sure that they're all okay. Oil temp's getting up there, but uh, that's just where it is on the ground in the P-47. And we check the fuel, quantity and tank selection, the attitude trim, and we're not going to do a run-up. We're just going to go on faith that uh, the engine's okay, primarily in the interest of of uh, video length. So we're going to take the runway. I'm going to go to full power, well, full power without the turbo. So 52 inches, roughly 2,000 horsepower. I feed in quite a bit of right rudder as we get going because the P factor is going to be pulling the thing to the left. It's not torque. Torque tries to roll the airplane. Can't do that with wheels on the ground. Now as I lower the nose, the gyroscopic precession pulls the wheels, pulls the nose to the left more. So I add a little bit more right rudder, then backed off of the right rudder. And then, when you pull back, you need a little bit of right rudder to counter the increased P-factor and a little bit of right stick to counteract the torque that comes into effect. Um, gear came up right after uh, the plane lifted off, and I've got the canopy closed up, and I'm looking around, checking for, primarily see if there's any anti-aircraft any fire going off that would indicate an enemy airplane coming in to attack me. And I'm going to get the power pulled back right away here to max continuous, 42 inches, 2550 RPM. That's a little earlier than you would normally do it. Normally you want to wait till you're at about 1,000 feet, but I'm not planning on going up very high or staying up there for very long. All right, we're turning crosswind here, basically 90 degrees uh, off of runway heading, more or less along the beach in this case. And right after that turn is complete, I'm going to turn downwind immediately. That'll be 180 degrees, so opposite of the runway heading. And uh, to calculate that, it, you just go with plus 2, minus 2. So 0, 8, 0, that's the runway heading. Uh, add 2 to the 0, subtract 2 from the 8, and you get 2, 6, 0. So we're turning to a 2, 6, 0 heading for downwind. Um, if it was a really high number, like 3, 1, 0, then you'd do the opposite, minus 2, plus 2, so you'd have 1, 3, 0. But um, anyway, that's how you do reciprocals, which you often need to do. You know, you need to go back from where you just came. Uh, you see some mosquitoes off there in the distance. I don't know where they're going yet. They could be going to hit the same target we are, although I'm recording this after the fact, so I know that's not the case. And we're going to uh, arm our weapons, and we just check everything. Gears up, flaps are up, weapons are armed. I can see my gun sight. Uh, all the temperatures are in check, power is set, and I'm going to look at my directional gyro again. So I show about 265 on the magnetic compass, so it's processed again. Um, and it will do that.
from time to time. Primarily, the earlier in the flight, the more it does it, or at very low power settings, or if you're maneuvering a lot. Those those tend to um, make it process more. All right, we're coming up on our first fix, and we're going to make our turn towards Carrington. And from the center of this town toward to Carrington, it's about a 161 heading. So we may get that off a little bit just based on when we started our turn, because it's a big turn, but that's okay. So we're turning to 161, and you'll notice the magnetic compass is pretty worthless while you're in a turn, but uh, the directional gyro is meaningful, that's why you need both. Those mosquitoes look like they're not a factor, looking for enemy aircraft, looking for traffic. We are crossing the final approach course of runway 8 at Asville, although we're down pretty low, shouldn't be a problem. And uh, now we're rolling out on that 161 heading, and you can see the smoke to the right there, that's not Carrington and it's easy to get baited if you were just using strict pilotage it's easy to get baited and to start get starting to get off course so we want to fly our heading until we're sure that we see something that is um, associated with our route and we know where we are so uh, that smoke like i say it's not carrington but it's easy to get baited in because there could be smoke at carrington because there are u.s forces there and they get they get bombed from time to time At this point, uh, we're cruising at about 275 miles per hour indicated, which in practical terms is also our true airspeed. So we're moving about four and a half-ish miles a minute. And so all of these legs are going to be pretty short because I planned it out that way. Now I can see Carrington up ahead. I'm not sure if you can see it. I don't know how, how well this is going to come through on YouTube. But there's a small, well, it's not small, but on the horizon in a distance, it's a small smokestack. Oh, we're checking for enemies and there aren't any. That's actually a little scary. I'll explain why in a minute. You know, it's because they are there. We just don't know it. The smokestack at Carrington is pretty small and the U.S. forces are going to be right near that. So I want to fly right near that smokestack so that as I check 6, if there's somebody that I don't easily see at 6 o'clock, um, friendly fire tracers will point it out to me. So the first smokestack there is at Carrington. The second one is a town that's just a little bit past Carrington. So I want to go to that first smokestack and then turn back to our 161 heading to go to St. Lowe. So everything looks fine so far. Engine temp still good. We haven't got bounced. We still have our bombs with us. I'm uh, pretty happy with how this mission is going. And uh, if you look to the left, and I'll try and look at it, you'll see the U.S. forces there, which will include a Sherman tank. Uh, there's a half-track. Pretty sure it's an M2A. I think that's the only one that's in DCS. And there you go. You can see them there. Uh, it might be an armored car there. It's a little hard to tell when you go past these things really fast. DCS actually has a surprising amount of detail in all of these things. You know, if you ditch the plane there, uh, you can walk up to those those things, and and you'll see they have more detail than you might think. All right, we're in our shallow turn to get back on, because it turned out 161 wasn't exact to Carrington, probably because we didn't start our turn towards it at quite the right time, but uh, that's fine. So now we're on our 161 course, or heading. Since there's no wind, it's the same as course. We're on our 161 magnetic heading over towards St. Lowe, and we're checking six. I don't see any tracers, so I think we're really safe. And it will take a while for someone in a, tra in a tail chase to gain on us. Moving at 275 miles an hour is pretty good. I mean, the German planes, if they're at really high power settings and they're not carrying anything, they're faster, but, but we're not exactly slow here. Uh, you can see some smoke on the horizon, and that is St. Lowe. And the U.S. forces, I happen to know, are to the left of the smoke, or at least the smoke you can see now. They're right by another giant smokestack that's putting out a relatively small amount of white smoke. I don't think that we can see it from here. So... Uh, this leg's going to take a few minutes, so I want to talk about uh, the weapons I chose. And I chose the 250 pounders, and by the way, we're obviously looking around for enemy aircraft here. I chose the 250 pounders because you can drop them and have them detonate on contact. I don't like to have a lot of delay. Actually, I'm not sure if I can set the P-47 up to have a bomb delay. I need to check that. In any case, I don't like delay because then the anti-aircraft fire is continuing to fire at you as you're um, 
after you dropped your ordnance. I, I like the, the threat to be eliminated as quickly as possible. But with the bigger bombs, bigger than 250 pounds, if you drop them from a low enough altitude to be really accurate, they tend to damage your airplane. The 250s are weak enough so that I can do damage to the target and still pull away and, and uh, escape the explosion damage. Now, that, that thing about uh, no bogeys detected, we got to talk about that for a second, because I keep checking radar and that's what we're seeing. And that only means that they're either staying so low they're not on radar or they're in an area where the radar is knocked out. So it's actually a little scary when you see no bogeys detected because uh, that doesn't mean they're not there and they could be pretty close so this tactic of staying low you're hard to see you're, you're not going to be picked up on radar we're moving relatively fast so that makes us a little harder to intercept even if they do get a report about where we are we won't be there by the time they get there and uh, you know once again we're checking six o'clock you know we're looking all around and staying vigilant and the tactic of overflying friendly forces is very effective. Uh, for one thing, it not only helps spot the enemy, but then you can decide to stay there and force the fight there, so they're going to be taking anti-aircraft fire uh, while they're dogfighting you. So that's an extremely useful tactic, and almost, I mean, a lot of people on DCS use that. So here's that smokestack I talked about earlier. This is St. Lowe, and uh, the U.S. forces are here and uh, you can actually ditch in this little yard here in a P-47. There's enough room to do it and then uh, hitch a ride on a half track back to base. I mean, or into town to go to the, uh, well, whatever type of entertainment you're looking for in France uh, as a young man in 1945. In any case, uh, now you can't really get on the half track and hitch a ride, but you know, we're thinking on this mission as if we're really flying this. So we're now flying that 170 heading we talked about until we're south of the town, turn into 140, Climbing, very shallow climb. I don't want to sacrifice a lot of speed and get caught at low speed in this thing. Sometimes it takes a while to get the 47 to accelerate. And we also want to be high enough so we can easily find our target. So we're switching to pure pilotage now. I mean, well, we're still kind of dead reckoning because we're flying at 140 heading. But we're looking out our window. You can see that river to the left. We talked about that when we looked at the map um, in our pre-flight phase when we were talking about navigation. And that really is saving trouble now. I don't want to have to look at the map in flight. You know, when your head's down, that's when you get killed. There's uh, there's Square Town that we talked about. I forgot the real name now. And there are the two skinny towns, and they point the way right to Terigny, where our targets are going to be. So that's where we're headed. So we have found our town, and remember, after our attack run, we're going to circle to the right because we don't want it to get confused with the very similar looking town to the left. And I want to shoot something here with my machine guns. I'm not going to go in right with the bombs. I want to set, shoot something that is going to catch on fire. Uh, half track is a great choice. Let's just bob and weave a little bit there, dodge that stuff. Uh, this is a nice half track here. So we'll give them some love with the 50 cals. There were two, uh, two there and we're shooting at them with a lot of lead. So I believe we set both of them on fire there. Yeah, we did. Now the point of that the, that is going in with a strafing run first is because now with those things on fire and one of them just exploded that makes it a lot easier to stay oriented as we come around for another pass you would be amazed how easily it is after your first pass to not be able to get reoriented and, and find your targets again but if there's something on fire that really helps so as a general rule the things you can destroy with machine guns are trucks um, they've got nice opal trucks. It's actually kind of a nice truck, but anyway, they, they light up pretty easy. Half tracks, 50 calibers will make a mess of half tracks, especially when you're shooting at a half track with eight of them from the angle at which we're coming in. And uh, German armored cars, you can punch through those and light them up also. Don't even bother coming in with 50 cals at a tank. You probably won't even damage it, and if you do, it's going to be something really superficial. Uh, Although maybe you could take out the, you know, top mounted machine gun on it or something. So here we're going to come in for a bomb run and I'm going to drop them all at once and I'm going to drop them on a tank even though I know that there's almost zero chance of us taking out the tank with the bombs. We'll get close. We've dropped them. Now we're pulling up. Uh, we dropped all three and, you know, that was really close to the tank 
and I pro yeah, it's still shooting at us. It survived. It, it it's very hard to take out a tank with bombs. It's actually very hard to take out a tank with airplanes. If if you are hell bent on doing it, I really suggest you take some rockets with you. So uh, we have two vehicles destroyed. Maybe we damaged that tank. Obviously not enough, so it couldn't shoot back at us. Might have knocked a track off or something. That'd be nice, so at least it won't move around. We'll come in for another machine gun pass. I see a half track there, just above the gun sight. We're going to come in on that and light him up. And, okay, he's on fire, so that's great. So we've got three vehicles down. Well, they're not actually down yet, but they're damaged enough they're on fire. And it's pretty rare that the fire goes out in time. Uh, when you see tracers coming at you, just dodge them. What you want to do, though, is avoid being triangulated, especially when you're down low focusing on your attack run. Uh, that's when you tend to get hit. If you're flying right towards an enemy uh, that's shooting at you uh, from the ground, that's a bad situation also. So triangulation or flying directly towards them, that's when it becomes really, really hard to avoid any aircraft fire. But at this kind of distance, you know, you can just bob and weave, which is why if we're coming in here with two P-47s, this becomes really, really easy. The first guy just stays at about the, the limit of the anti-aircraft fire and they'll and get some shooting at him, and then we'll dodge while the second guy comes in and cleans up. All right, we've got uh, some other people here. I'm not sure what that is yet. Uh, oh, it's a half track. Uh, that was, boy, that was a pathetic miss, though. I mean, we might have scratched the paint, but I didn't really do much. Um, that's disappointing. I feel shame. All right, we'll come back around, try and redeem ourselves. And I'm not coming around looking for any specific target. In other words, I don't necessarily want to go back to that same half track. Um, although I guess if I hit it at all, that would be best for economy of ammunition. But I'm more interested in time. I want to make another pass, and I want to get out of here because I know these guys have called for help, and I know that there are two at least two competent human players with Dora 9s that can easily run me down. So I don't want that fight. Um, Alright, we'll come in. That's an Opal truck. Like I said, it's kind of a nice truck. Alright, so he's lit up. Uh, that was a little bit overkill. And anyway, in addition to the human players that have undoubtedly heard that somebody's attacking Axis forces at Terigny, uh, the computer planes will come this way also. So it's time to, to leave this party. And we're going to turn to our 260 heading and go to hit the German headquarters. And now we're, we're free of bombs. We're also pretty light. We've expended a fair bit of ammo and a fair bit of fuel. So, you know, now we're a pretty fast airplane. We still have the bomb racks on. Uh, the center bomb rack doesn't cause any real drag in the P-47. It's just installed in all the airplanes, uh, all the, the types that you would fly in DCS. The bomb racks on the wings cost a little bit of drag, maybe three miles an hour. Um, so no big deal there. We're effectively a clean airplane. We're very light. Uh, we still have plenty of fuel left for the mission. We took no hits in those attacks, so that's great. Now we want to check, after all that maneuvering, our directional gyro. And even though it's been a while, we've been in good power, the, the maneuvering causes it to precess. So now it's set. And so we were flying the wrong heading for a few moments there. No big deal. Let's get back to our 260 heading. Check six. Unfortunately, the sun is there, um, which is a little bit concerning. You know, somebody could be coming in, uh, either one of the computer flown planes or one of the human flown planes. Um, and like I say, there are two Doras. Now, we can overmatch one Dora in a 1v1 fight. Now, the Dora can run away, but. You know, if it stays in that fight, we're probably going to win that. But two Doras? No, that's a bad deal. All right, once again, no bogeys detected. That doesn't really give me the warm feeling I would like because of the way the system works. Uh, oh, exterior shot. Isn't my plane beautiful? I think it really is. I, I like this paint scheme. And this is a historic paint scheme and nose art for this airplane. You can see I've got the no the bomb racks on the wings there. And, and I don't think I've ever seen a picture of a European theater P-47 that's flying into combat, not one that's being transported to Europe or something. It doesn't have the bomb racks on. Same with the P-51. So that's really the most authentic way to uh, use this airplane in DCS if, if that level of authenticity is your thing. 
I just checked the map there. Uh, that's generally a bad practice. I don't know why I'm doing this. But uh, I'm looking for the shapes of the forest and the towns and hopefully not flying into the ground while I do this. Um, like I say, don't, don't do that. But anyway, we're over a big forest. I did identify it on the map and I did verify that we're on course. But uh, this is a time you really just kind of need to you know, rely on the faith in your pre-flight planning and be flying the right heading, be double checking it against the magnetic compass and uh, fly for the right amount of time and you're going to get there or you're going to get darn close so when you uh, come up to altitude a little bit later your target will be more or less in front of you, let's say between 11 to 1 o'clock. Uh, we talked about the bombs, we talked about trying to catch things on fire during the attack run, I think that's really important. Um, as far as the engine stuff goes, cow flaps, when you're getting up above 200 miles an hour, you're going to fully close them. I leave uh, the oil cooler shutters fully open all the time, and the uh, intercooler shutters in the neutral position. And that's going to work for really everything. When you have a P-47 engine fail, failure due to the way you're operating it, 90% of the time it's due to oil temperature because you're using a lot of power at very low speeds. So hedge things in your favor there. Just leave the oil cooler shutters fully open. I'm not talking about the cowl flaps, oil cooler shutters. They don't really cost any real performance. Now if I'm going to be in a prolonged low and slow fight using a lot of horsepower, I'll also crack the cowl flaps open a little bit. Not a lot, like say three seconds uh, on the switch. Okay, once again, no bogeys detected, and we're going to start climbing up, and hopefully we'll get our targets in sight. There are those three mosquitoes, so they're north of us to the right, and it looks like they're going back to base. So they either hit the target we're going to now, or they may have gone on an anti-shipping raid. I'm not really sure. Hopefully they hit the target we're going to now. Well, I guess hopefully. I mean, the upside is they would have hopefully knocked out some of the anti-aircraft. The downside is uh, they could have attracted unwanted Luftwaffe attention. All right, there's the town. That's our target. And the German forces are grouped on this side of the town. So basically, same tactic that we used back at Terigny, except now we don't have bombs. I'm just verifying that I'm looking at the right town in the IM. Um, you can safely do that once you're up at altitude. Although, like I say, if you have proper pre-flight planning and faith in yourself, you really shouldn't have to check that map too much. And I wrote down on a little card the headings I was going to fly from one to the other. You know, I flew uh, 161 and then 161 and then 170, 142, 60 and then 011 later. So I had that little card um, taped to my monitor, so I really don't have to do a lot of thinking uh, navigation wise. All right, I'm seeing some bad guys down there gonna roll in on the heading. I, I problem is I'm only seeing where they are. I don't have a specific target picked out yet. And uh, wow, I wish I had some bombs with me. I see that there's a guard tower there with machine guns. I think that's a good spot to drop some bombs. Oh, two of them. Oh, we're already people are shooting at us. It's not not. I mean, I guess that's to be expected. Um, I didn't didn't see anything I could line up on in time. Whoa, I'm not sure if I just got hit there or not, but. In any case, that was really close. I didn't didn't dodge. The German gunner's ability to lead your airplane and shoot accurately is really good. Uh, so you have to stay at a distance and then alter your course when you see tracers coming your way. Now, on this server, and I don't know if this is a DCS thing, on this server, the German anti-aircraft is much more accurate and dangerous than the Allied anti-aircraft, which in a historical context certainly makes sense. I mean, we know the Germans had a lot of practice at that, and the Allies, you know, I mean, heck, the German forces never saw German airplanes. You know, the forces defending Allied bases certainly didn't. All right, we're coming in on an attack run. Line, wow, there's a lot of people shooting at us. Lining up on something, and oh, oh no, that's, that's no good. So we just took a lot of hits from the front. Uh, hopefully they did not hit one of my plane's two oil coolers. I know they didn't hit me, the pilot, so that's good. The Thunderbolt has a lot of protection for the pilot from the front and rear, so I feel, uh, I feel pretty good about that. And it looks like uh, we didn't take any critical damage to the engine. 
and the way you'll know is you'll see oil pressure falling or oil temperature rising that means your time is very limited um, I'll get to other things to check in a moment at this point I was actually hoping I did have some significant damage so that I could demonstrate uh, those procedures in the video uh, it turns out the the Thunderbolt just kind of tanked right through that we got some we certainly have some superficial damage and I'm not thrilled about the damage on the canopy that makes it harder to see and every scratch now looks like an enemy airplane in some distance but uh, anyway we're not going in to attack them again so that that entire attack was a failure and we're gonna go to our 011 heading in order to get back to uh, or get to Lassay which is the airport that we planned on uh, returning to or not returning but going to I don't see any enemies behind us. Nobody's on radar. That's a pretty good sign at this point. And uh, we're heading to our base. Now, when you get hit like this, first thing you want to notice is, can I still fly the airplane? You know, is it responding to the controls? And of course, I already know that. You know that right away. Yeah, the, the plane's flying okay. It's a little, little wobbly, but it's nothing that uh, is really concerning me at all. So that makes me happy still worried about enemy aircraft as you can see here now the other thing you want to think about is the next thing I should say is how is my engine and and with this airplane you're thinking about oil first um, if you took a hit to the oil system you've got to start start planning to be on the ground pretty soon but oil temperature and pressures in this case are fine and uh, right in here we're just looking at landmarks these are noticeable places on the map so I, I know I'm on course plus when we're flying from uh, you know, our target up to let's say, I mean really all we have to do is keep the ocean off to the left. And you can see that just in the right about where that X just was, uh, you can see sort of an almost round bay uh, and that's a very noticeable landmark. So let's say is about that distance again from here to that round section and then that much again farther up to get to let's say. Anyway, back, back to when you take damage, you want to think about the engine first. And our engine is fine, so the next thing you want to look at, and I'm sure I'll look down at it uh, pretty soon here, is hydraulic pressure. I want to make sure that my hydraulics work because that's going to need, be needed for the gear and flaps. And if they're not working, I'm going to have to start getting ready for manual gear extension. Honestly, I don't care about the flaps because I'm not going anywhere that I'm going to really need them. But uh, I would like to put the gear down. You know, we want to get this plane back to base and we want to get it back to base in the best condition that we can. I mean, you know, there are different ways of, though there's the hydraulic pressure gauge I'm looking at. The hydraulics are fine. And and don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I know it's a simulator and, uh, you know, I'm here to have fun. And there are a lot of times that I absolutely go, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. And, you know, I'm, I can be a very reckless player. But in this particular mission, I'm treating it like, you know, I'm really trying to uh, advance the Allied cause. You know, I'm trying to do damage to the enemy, I'm trying to complete my mission, I'm not getting distracted and going to do the things I want to do. And I'm trying to get the plane back in one piece, because in 1944 dollars, this thing cost 83,000 bucks. That was a huge amount of money back then. So, uh, if we don't have hydraulics, I'm going to start getting mentally prepared to use the hand pump and pump the gear down. I'm not going to, like I say, I'm not worried about the flaps. The other thing is, I want to look at my electrical generator, which I can see on the left side of the screen, the lowest gauge on the left side right now. And if that needle's at zero, then that means that my wonderful Curtis Electric prop, which is a paddle prop, uh, there were several paddle plop props, we have a Curtis Electric on this airplane. It's a really nice one. It's, the, it's, it's got the propeller cuffs, I mean, it's the whole deal. And uh, if the generator fails, then I only have a short amount of time that the battery will be able to operate that prop. So what I'm going to do is go to fixed pitch on the propeller, and uh, or manual pitch. Actually, no, I'm going to go to fixed pitch, so it just stays where it is. And I'm going to turn off the battery to save the battery power, and then turn it on again when I uh, want to use my constant speed prop. Anyway, all that stuff's fine, though. I mean, we just, like I say, we took damage, but nothing that's going to really matter. All right, we're coming in. Uh, not really a very, really a very square base turn, but uh, that's what we're going to do. I really want to get this thing on the ground, and I'm doing my uh, before landing checklist. So, Gump, remember how takeoff was cigar? 
Uh, again, this is a World War II era thing, and I know that because I flew with a number of these guys very early in my career. Uh, and it's considered very unprofessional now, so don't do it with your flight instructor. But gas undercarriage mixture prop. I look at the fuel quantity, I make sure that I'm on that tank, and it's the right tank for landing. Put the gear down, set the mixture and prop, and in this case, the mixture and prop were all we're already where I want them. I want 2550 RPM, because I'm not going above 42 inches manifold pressure in a go around. And um, auto rich is where we left it this whole time. So coming in for our landing. Uh, it's actually a regulation that you land in the touchdown zone, the first 3,000 feet of the runway. A regulation today, I don't know what they did back in World War II. Uh, so I'm pretty happy with that landing, I guess. You know, it's in the touchdown zone, it's on the center line. Um, you know, if I was the co-pilot, the captain would not be yelling at me, and if I was the captain, I would be very pleased with the co-pilot for that. So, uh, we're going to start slowing the thing down. Thunderbolt's heavy, you know, it rolls a long way with... Uh, unless you really get on the brakes, but it has great brakes too. So I guess we'll take this turn off up here. And uh, again, I'm sort of in a mode where I'm thinking about it like it's a somewhat real airplane, although I am in a taxi through the mud here in a moment, but uh, that's just in the interest of video brevity. And as we taxi in, I'm going to retract the flaps and most importantly I'm going to open the cowl flaps all the way because we don't want to overheat the motor because we could uh, elect to repair the airplane here and then fly uh, fly off of this field for the next attack for example if I wanted to go back up to German headquarters which we're not doing we're we're done um mixture to idle cutoff that's how you shut off an airplane and I'm not following any procedure here so don't pay any attention to this I'm just randomly turning off switches more or less make it look like I'm doing some sort of shutdown procedure. Uh, batteries going off. I mean, I really should disarm all the weapons, and I think procedurally they would put the fuel selector back to off in these things and, uh, and do some other stuff. So we're going to climb out, which in DCS the only way to do is to jump, uh, bail out. But anyway, we'll take a look at the damage. Uh, there's our beautiful Curtis Electric prop paddle blades and with cuffs. Uh, the only thing that was maybe a little better, Hamilton Standard had a hydraulic prop, but it was pretty rare on these things. We definitely took some damage. I mean, our propellers hit, our cowl is hit all over the place, our windshields hit, a little bit of hits to the wings, but like I say, the P-47 really is a bit of a tank, which makes it one of the most fun airplanes to fly in DCS. Uh, because you can do really good air-to-air -air and air-to-ground with this thing. And it looks like so far we're actually the we're the leader on the scoreboard. Uh, we got four kills, 25 points. I think the score is also affected by your losses. In other words, when you lose a plane, it goes down, and we certainly didn't lose a plane. So uh, that's it for that, and uh, let's conclude this. I think the P-47 is really a great warbird to fly in DCS. Now, I don't necessarily think it's a great first warbird to fly in DCS for a few reasons. First of all, the plane is a handful at low speeds and high power settings, and sometimes in dogfights, that's kind of where you end up. Also, the cockpit layout is not uh, very well set up certainly not compared to say an FW-190. The, the layout in the P-47 is just not intuitive. And engine management and system management in general, but specifically engine management, is pretty complicated in the 47. So while I don't think it's a good first warbird, it is a great overall warbird, probably the best, let's say, second warbird to fly because you can do everything with it really well. It's probably the best high altitude dogfighter in the sim, P-51 Mustang might have something to say about that, but it's going to come down to fuel loads and the exact altitude we're talking about. Now, at low and mid altitudes, the P-47 is slightly superior in dogfighting to any of the FW-190s and slightly inferior to the 109K-4, but not so much so that it's going to be a, a hopeless situation by any means. Then in terms of air to ground, the 47 is extremely good because it's rugged, as we saw in this video, it can definitely take some hits, and it can dish out a lot of pain. It can carry 2,500 pounds worth of bombs, 10 5-inch rockets, and 850 cals with a lot of ammunition. And there's nothing on the map you're not going to be able to obliterate and then some with all of that firepower. 
Now, if you want to fly a mission where you do air to ground and then air to air, and that's really fun, uh, this is the layout I suggest. A Thunderbolt with deleted wing racks and a single centerline bomb, either 250 or this one's a 500 pounder. That enables you to come in, do a strafing run, come back around, drop the bomb, and then either wait around there for enemy fighters or go somewhere else to attack enemy fighters. Uh, and then at this point, your plane is in a very clean configuration. It's as clean aerodynamically as if you took off with the plane configured for a, for a pure air-to-air -air mode. And even after that strafing run, you're probably going to have more ammunition on the plane than a P-51 Mustang starts with. So you're in a very good position for air-to-air -air combat. This is really a fun type of mission to fly in the P-47. Now, if you want to fly the mission I just flew, um, well, you really have to do that on the Wolfpack server because otherwise those targets might be not, not be at those same locations. The maps will be the same, but the different servers put things in different places. So if you go to the Wolfpack server, these are the uh, magnetic headings you're going to have to fly to get to those fixes and those targets. And if you do that, let me know in the comments if you get a better score than I did, which I hope you do, and you should be able to because I obviously really fumbled that uh, attack at the German headquarters of Braille. So that's all I've got for now. Uh, thanks again for watching and have a great day.